get any better than that. All right. So it is 928, which is the date at about 130. We went over some stuff about uh, drugs in the clinic and some other stuff, the dress code. So we're going to start back into math. So the last time we left, we were talking about that fun topic, research. We're going to put research behind us now and talk about time because time is going to become very important in physical therapy. I got some laughs, at least I appreciate it. In therapy and most therapy clinics, it is going to be required that you understand military time is what most people call it. The real term for it is universal time, right? That is operating on a 24 hour clock versus the AM PM clock. And the main reason for that, and I can speak from experience on the coding aspect is with coding for, you know, electronic health records and that it's a lot easier if I don't have to have AM PM in my code. Right? If I can just go 0000 to 2359, it's a lot easier for me to code those healthcare systems. It also avoids confusion. Because if I say 3 o'clock and we're using AM, PM, there's two options for that. Meet me at 3. Well, I'm not going to meet you at 3 AM. Well, no, I'm at 3 PM, right? Medicare prefers us using military time, right? I call it military time is just habit of me, right? I grew up on this time frame. I don't think I've ever owned a watch that I haven't had in military time. Even like my, um, I have a couple of the fancy schmancy watches that you wear out when, you know, one time when you go to the fancy restaurants, even those, my chronographs have military time on them just because I'm used to it. I look at like a right, like if I looked and it says like 2 p.m., I'm, I actually am sitting there doing it in my head, okay, that's 1400. That's the way my brain works at this point. So it begins at 0000, otherwise known as ODARC 100, right? Which is midnight. From there, it progresses all the way till we get to 11.59 PM, it's just 23.59. One thing to note, and don't get caught up on this because I've actually seen a question on your boards like this where they talk about conversion to military time because it is a required skill. Military time or standard universal time or universal time does not include a colon. So if it's midnight, it's zero, 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 no colon there. So don't be tricked if it's asking you right 1 a.m. in military time and you go down. <laughs> he just wants to hang out with us. I'm telling you, I love it. I'm a cat person, so I'm okay with that. The first answer you're going to go down in that multiple choice, if it says, you know, right 1 a.m. in military time, the first answer is going to be 01 colon 00. And a good 30% of you is going to look at that and go, that's my answer. And you're going to lose points because the colon can't be there. It should be 0100 or 0100, right? So how does it work? Well, everything up to noon is exactly the way you've always learned it, right? One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock, five o'clock. No, it's kidding. All the way up to noon is just the single digits. Once you get to 12 o'clock and you go into the afternoon, which we would normally experience, that's when you start adding a number to 12. So one o'clock is 1300. Two o'clock is 1400. I would highly suggest you start getting your phones, you know, these fancy dicey things, and you get your watches or whatever else set to military time. So you start getting it ingrained in you. I have friends that are still in physical therapy that still don't get this. You know, these are grown physical therapists that they literally are like, hey, so I finished time at 435. What time is that in military time? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Come on, do the math, right? So if it's in the afternoon, you just add 12 to it. If it's 235 in the afternoon, it's 1435, right? The minutes don't change. Those always stay the same, but the hour is what changes. So looking at the clocks, this is kind of the way the clocks look, right? So if it's two o'clock, right? It could be two o'clock AM or two o'clock PM. That's a lot different in military time where it's 0200 or 1400. A lot of my stuff will be posted specifically for end of day on the day that it's due. End of day for me is 23.59. So at 23.59.59, when it rolls over to 2400 or 00, zero your stuff's late. And don't come to me and go, oh, well, I've had this before. 
oh, well, I tried to submit it at midnight, but I got behind. I had weeks before that. I ain't giving that credit back. I'm sorry, right? Don't wait until the last minute to get something done, especially with the fact that with the way Cox and Comcast and Century Link have been recently, with internet going up and down, left and right, sideways, don't cheat yourself out of that stuff, right? It's one of the reasons why I now, I paid for a data plan on my phone for um, tethering because I've had a couple times where I've tried to teach and my internet's been out because Cox decided that the sun was in the wrong horizon or something. I have no idea why Cox went down. They don't ever tell you they don't, they just go down. And so I've had to have a backup internet. Don't cheat yourself out of that type of stuff. Know when your stuff is due. Make sure you understand when it's due. Most of us in this program use military time, but some of them may challenge you. Put 2 p.m. just to see if it throws you off, right? So hours have four digits. 1 a.m. is 0100. 10 a.m. is 1000. Anything that affects. After 12, you're always going to add 12 to any time. So 2 p.m. becomes 1400. 536 p.m. becomes 1736. And when you're speaking it, it depends upon your, your stuff. You know, military, we have different terms for all of these. Like 1230 would be, you know, 0030, but it's also O dark 30 is what we refer to it in the military because usually it's dark out at 12 o'clock. If it's not dark out at 12 o'clock, we've had a drastic shift in our polls and we're in trouble. What do you have to know for this? For your boards, you have to be able to convert. If I give you a question that says that it is 4.35 in the afternoon, you have to be able to know that 4.35 in the afternoon is 16.35. I haven't, so John asked if anyone's had problems with Zoom meetings, the internet going down. Sometimes it happens, John, sure. That's why I record all my lectures. That way, if you do go down and you get out of class and you're not able to get back in, you can always at least go back and watch it. I try to do that for you guys because sometimes crap happens. It just does, right? So even if something happens, I'll always have the recording up for you, if nothing else. Roman numerals. This is silly. When I first thought, when I first looked at my syllabus for math and like, why do I have to teach Roman numerals? This is dumb. And then I remembered, oh, we do use Roman numerals. And I'll talk about why we do, right? So Roman numerals, um, funny, I, I actually did a poll once just to, on Twitter that I, I said that we need to stop teaching Arabic numerals in school because why are we teaching Arabic numerals? And you'd be amazed at how many people actually agreed with me. And it just showed me how many people that follow me have serious bias. And I'm like, okay, those are the people I'm going to unfollow for now, right? Arabic numerals are what we've been dealing with forever. Zeros, ones, twos, threes, five, sevens. That's Arabic numerals, right? It came from, you know, based in Islam and everything. You can go back and look at the history of math. You know, a lot of our math comes from ancient Islam and Babylonian teaching, right? Romans decided that wasn't good enough and came up with their own numerals which are just nothing but letters. Thanks, Romans, right? And so we have to kind of learn them both. Why do we have to learn them both? We learn that we use Roman numerals specifically when we're talking about cranial nerves. And you're gonna learn about cranial nerves soon enough in anatomy, right? This is a little breakdown on how to figure out, remember math sense, right? So this is Roman numeral one is I or capital I. Most times you're going to see capital I for everything. Two is two, blah, blah, blah. When you get to a change in a letter where we now go from I's to five being a V, the number before it will be one number minus five. So four is one minus five. Why did Romans do this? I have no idea. There is all kinds of math theory and physics that if you go, or uh, theory and ratios and stuff like that you go back and you look at this there is no logical reason why romans did this none no one knows why they started doing why five isn't five eyes why six isn't six eyes no one has an idea they just did it and unfortunately we've been suffering through it ever since so you just have to basically know how to kind of look at a roman numeral and understand it because again this is kind of looking at how roman numerals work because this is where they're going to come into play for physical therapy, which is cranial nerves. 
right? Cranial nerves are the nerves that come out of the brain. They are very important to us because they help us with our most basic senses, right? So we have cranial nerves, olfactory, which means smell, right? And we know right now with COVID, one of the first, it's, it's, which is interesting, is starting to show that COVID might have some brain effect too. Two of the first signs of COVID are loss of sense of smell and loss of sense of taste. So there might be some effect of COVID on the brain, right? But we have olfactory, which helps us with smell, optic, see, ocular motor, moving our eyes around to see, right? Trochlear, another eye movement one. Trigeminal has to do with sensation and movement on the face. My favorite cranial nerve, cranial nerve six, which is abducens. Sorry, so th those who that are video gamers will get that, but otherwise, I'm sorry if you don't get it, right? It's abduction of the eye or moving laterally of the eye. Facial, right, ah, let's see, I got one. Facial nerve, that's the nerve that helps us smile or not smile or frown or look bored. Vestibular cochlear, that's the nerve of hearing and balance. Again, this is not so important for math, but this shows you where we have to know these because I'm gonna tell you a little story of how this can be a problem. In 2000 and I wanna say it was 13, I'm losing my, I'm, I'm getting old, so I'm mixing my years up now. I was transferring a patient, very, very large patient, 500 plus pounds. In the middle of transferring the patient, the patient started falling and grabbed a hold of my head. When they grabbed a hold of my head, they twisted my head. In twisting my head, they fractured C4, 5, and 6. Completely snapped my vertebrae. Now, I spent, I, workers' comp, obviously, everything like that. I needed surgery desperately because within two weeks, I lost all use of my left arm. First, it started with I lost sensation, and then my arm just died. I had it in a sling. It wasn't doing anything. It had completely compressed all of this brachial plexus over here. I had pinky movement. That was about the only, I could, I could basically do the, uh, the, the whole pinky movement. That was it and nothing else. And so I couldn't figure out, I'm getting, I'm going to therapy, I'm going to Concentra, which was the company that handles most of our unfortunate workers comp. Couldn't figure out why I was not getting surgery. I needed surgery, I need surgery, I need surgery. Well, so they send my, boss, because I was the director of rehab at the time, they sent my boss, who's a regional director, who was also a PT, an email saying, he says, why are you, we need him back in the clinic. Why are you not doing surgery on him? And they sent back saying, well, there's no need to do surgery for cranial nerve four, five, and six, because surgery is not going to repair it. So when Concentra was sending my reports over to the workers' comp company, which is Sedgwick, they were sending it over saying that my damage was to CN4, CN5, CN6. What they meant was cervical nerve, right? But they were writing them as if they were cranial nerve. And so Sedgwick's like, I, we can't fix nerves in the brain. So we finally got that corrected. Two days later, I'm into a neurosurgeon. About a week later, I'm in surgery. It's amazing how something as simple as that can screw up someone's progress. And I'm living proof of it. To this day, I have no sensation in this hand. I have motor movement, it's a lot weaker. This hand is a lot weaker than my right hand, but I, no, nothing there. I can do a neat trick. I can stick my hand in ice and just leave it there because I don't feel anything, right? It's a great uh, party trick. But so that's why we have to make sure if they had listed this, at, and they did, they listed it as CNIV, CNV, CNVI. That's literally why Sedgwick thought it was cranial nerve. That was a PT who didn't understand their basic training. As soon as we corrected that, things got fixed. So make sure you're very specific. There's a big difference between cranial nerves and cervical nerves, right? If they had written CN and the number four, totally different world. Now we're talking about cervical nerve roots. So that's how these Roman numerals come into play. It would have been better if they had just wrote cervical nerve root, but whatever, the PT was lazy. Does that make sense why we have to learn those? Uh, this slide this slide here particularly is not in the math book, but that's why I added it. This is just to explain why we have to learn cranial nerves in math. 
which is a little silly to me, but whatever. We will go with what they say because the Department of Education says so, and because they say so, we say so. That's it for this lecture. Let me bring up the next one. I posted this one last night, so if you didn't see it, it did get posted last night. Share screen. I've been editing stuff up to the night before because I'm making some massive changes to it to make it a little bit easier for you guys. So I hope you appreciate that because doing this remotely is a little different than doing it face to face. So we're going to talk about parts to a whole temperatures and some weird stuff like that now for a little bit. And we've got about a half hour before I give you a break before Dr. Johnson's class. So fractions, decimals. When we talk about fractions and we talk about decimals, really we're talking about the same thing, right? We're talking about a part to a whole relationship. We'll cover that in a little bit. So we're gonna talk about fractions, talk about decimals, doing general math with them, converting decimals to fractions, fractions to decimals, and why this is important for physical therapy again, which will be temperature conversions and equivalencies. So fractions and decimals both represent a part to a whole relationship, right? One slice is part of one slice of pie is part of a whole pizza, right? Now I don't know who it only eats one slice of pizza, but there's probably one or two people that do it. Personally, I might think once one slice of pizza is just the pizza folded in half and eat it, but whatever. Um, no, I don't do that. I'm just joking. Half the pizza, one sip versus a whole cup of coffee, one step in a long walk, one vote in a critical election, right? All of that comes into play. Like I threw a little bit of politics in there at the very end. Oh my gosh. Not saying that we have a critical election, we have a critical election. So a number that has two components is a fraction. There's a part and a whole to it, a numerator and a denominator. So when we talk about fractions, like one minute is one part of a 60 minute time period for an hour, right? So one in 60 is the fraction for one minute. Four ounces is part of a whole 16 ounce pound. So four ounces would be about a quarter pound, which is why if you go to McDonald's, you get a quarter pounder. Originally before that piece of whatever it is, whether it's meat or not meat, I'm not sure what McDonald's serves anymore, goes onto the grill, it's four ounces. It may not come out four ounces, but when it started, it was four ounces of meat, or at least, you know, two and a half ounces of meat and the rest in fat. Not sure. Three hours is part of the whole day, right? When you have a three hour class, it may seem like it's the whole day, but it's not, it's only part of your day. The other class in the morning right now is having four hours of neuro rehab with me. They are pretty confident that they spend a week in four hours because it feels like it, right? But it's really only four hours of the day. It's only one sixth of their day, but it feels a lot longer. Even this hour and a half class sometimes will feel like it's you spend a week in here sometimes. But that's that fraction ratio, right? When you look at it, if you think about what you spend working, right? You normally on average, you're gonna spend about eight hours of your day working, right? That's eight hour day is kind of standard. So when you think about that, you're spending about one third of your day working. Now, if you're in Vegas, you're probably also gonna spend about a good quarter of your day driving to and from work because of traffic. Right? If you're from where I'm from and you drove and worked in DC, you basically spend half your day between working and driving and then that's it. You don't have anything else, right? But we spend a lot of our time doing stuff that isn't personal related. We really do, right? We don't do a lot of personal enrichment because by the time we get through driving to and from work, we get through our hours of work, we get home, get dinner, cook, eat dinner. We have like 45 minutes of time before we take a nap and go to bed, right? Our life, that's the way our life kind of works nowadays. Uh, we, we are conditioned to be basically nothing more than drone bees where we work, work, and we work to get time off so we don't have to work. That kind of, well, we're not even going to go into the theory of that, right? But we spend a lot of our time at work. Why is that important? Have any of you had jobs where you hated it? I'm sure a lot of you have. Yeah, right? So maybe you have it now. Pizza taco. I don't know where that came from. That sounds good. Um, maybe you have jobs now that you hate. When you spend eight hours at that place, it doesn't feel like eight hours. 
right? It sucks the life out of you. So that's why changing, I mean, you guys made a conscious choice to change your careers so that you can hopefully be in a field that is better. I will say I, I made that change. I made a change of careers and came to physical therapy. I don't really feel that I work a day in my life. Even preparing these classes, as much time as I spend doing this, I actually enjoy it. I'm, I find joy in my life again, which is kind of nice. You know, when I worked in IT, mm, I don't want to say I found joy, but I got paid, right? I made a lot more money in IT than I make here, but I hated life. Now I actually like life again. So there is something to having a better job, even if it's just nothing more than more and more rewarding, right? So sometimes we have to make sure that we have enough medicine. The client needs two teaspoons of milliliter dose, right? A 10 milliliter dose. We may have to make sure that we have enough, right? You've all probably, those of you that have kids, have encountered that where you go to give them maybe a little bit of uh, Robitussin or Dimetap to calm their coughs down, and you reach up and you pull out that bottle of Dimetap and you go to pour it out and it comes out and it's like a drip because you haven't checked it recently and you're out of medicine. I well, may not have enough to treat it. It's got to go run to Walgreens, get you some stuff. But that two teaspoons or 10 milliliter of dose is only part of what's in that bottle or should have been part of what's in that bottle. <clears throat> we use fraction to help visualize a mixture and relationship parts of the whole solution we're creating. We're going to talk briefly in physics about how to make admixtures for doing um, iontophoresis and phonophoresis. So we do need to understand fractions for healthcare, right? We have that numerator denominator, which is the part to a whole relationship, right? So we have one out of 12, we have one part to 12 parts of the whole. If you're a student right now, there's 26 of you. Well, maybe not 26 today because some of you did test out in my class. Good luck for you guys to test it out. But you are one of 26. That doesn't mean you're any less than the, other, the rest of the group, but you're only one out of the 26 class. So please understand that it's not that I'm don't have time for y'all, but I do have 26 you to manage, right? So proper fractions or common fractions, the numerator is less than the denominator. 3 7 24 47 9 11 Mixed numbers include a whole number and a proper fraction. So like 3 and 3 quarters, 12 and 9 11 103 and 13 20 seconds, right? <clears throat> this could be maybe you have a whole pizza and four slices of a pizza out of it. So you have one and a half pizzas. That's a mixed number, right? Versus just having that half pizza, you have four slices. So you have half of a pizza. Improper fractions, the numerator is greater or equal to or larger than the denominator. So 17 twelfths, 34 uh, 24 nine ninths. And when we have those are equal, that's nothing more than one. And we'll talk about that. Equivalent fractions, we need to find out in order to perform addition and subtraction with fractions, right? They're not written the same, but they're equal in value. It was possible to test out if you had the requisite prerequisites for it, Ann, just to let you know. You had to have a physics and a math class. And that you have to talk to Dr. O'Neill about. So I've, I don't deal with any of the test outs, so 100% honest. So 8 eighths is the same as 16 sixteenths, is the same as 32 sec 30 seconds, is the same as 64 sixty fourths, right? It's the same as one. All of those are equivalencies. 2 eighths is the same as 4 sixteenths, is the same as one quarter, is the same as 8 30 seconds. All of that involves looking at common denominators and making things kind of work out. We need to know this in order to do addition and subtraction of fractions. If we don't have those common denominators, we can't add and subtract fractions together. Again, the good news is most of you have a calculator, they'll do addition, subtraction of fractions. Great, saves you a lot of work. For those of you that don't know on your computer, if you're using your calculator on your computer, you can convert your calculator on your computer to scientific mode. And if you convert it to scientific mode, there's a little drop down that allows you to choose scientific. It'll allow you to do fractions. Huzzah. Um, for those of you that also don't know, and I don't know how many of you know this, but you can literally type a math problem into Google and it'll solve it for you. Yep. Now I'm not saying do that for my tests, not saying that, but 
Google will solve your math problems for you. Google pretty much does anything anymore. I'm pretty confident at some point Google is going to tell us when we need to brush our teeth and when we need to take baths. That's beside the point. So in the case that we have down bottom here, right, we have two large pieces, right? One half is shaded. So that, that kind of breaks us down. But at the same time, if we break down into eight slices, which is like a normal pizza, those four slices are still the same as half the pizza. Those are equivalent fractions. Whenever we deal with fractions, and specifically when we're dealing with answers to fractions, you always want to reduce it to the lowest possible reduction, lowest, in, lowest proper fraction possible, right? For example, if we have 4 eighths, 4 goes into 8, so that's not a reduced fraction, right? So 4 eighths, if we wanted to reduce it, right? So we have 4 over 8. Four goes into four one time, four goes into eight two times. So four eighths is the same as one half. Three ninths. Three goes into three one time, three goes into nine three times. So three ninths is the same as one third. That's those equivalent fractions. Reducing to the lowest possible fraction that you can do is the proper way to answer a question. So if I gave you a question and your answer came out to be 4 eighths, that'll be one of the answers down bottom. That's not the most correct answer. The most correct answer would be 1 half. So you have to be paying attention for it. So don't let yourself get tricked out and don't let Mr. McKeever's little tricky tricks mess you up, right? Because if I'm giving you a question, let's clear all this. And I say something like 3 eighths plus 1 eighths equals what? Well, the answer is 4 eighths. You're going to go down to your choices, and A is going to be 4 over 8. B is going to be, I don't know, 1 over 3. C is going to be 2 over 9. And then D is, that's a D, is going to be one half. Although this answer is technically correct, because the answer did come out to be four A's, the more correct answer is the reduced fraction of one half. And that's going to be an important. The reason we do this in math is because I have to teach you how to look for the most correct answer. Because for your boards, there are going to be sometimes, even in physical therapy questions, where there are going to be two answers that are possibly correct. But only one of them is going to be the most correct answer. And you have to make sure that kind of leads you into reading your answers. If you don't read all of your answers and you just go with A, and this is I mean, there is all kinds of psychometrician, which are scientists or psychologists that research numbers and testing that'll say, if you put that four eighths there, 33% of the class is going to pick four eighths, even if they know they have to reduce the fraction because they're like, four eighths, I'm done. Move on. Right. And that's where coming back and checking your work is important. Don't let yourself get cheated out of an easy point there. We're going to talk about what your scores are required for your boards. And if that was a board question, that could cause you the difference between passing your boards and failing your boards. And you don't want to let one question fail your boards. I've had it. I just had three students that tested in July that got a 599 out of 600. Imagine how you feel getting that score because they feel that way. Right. And like one of them goes, I changed three questions that I knew I shouldn't have changed. They didn't change one of those questions or a PTA. And now they've got to sit and wait till October. So don't let simple mistakes like that mess you up. Down here, the other questions or the other answers we have here, three sevenths. You can't reduce that any further. You can't reduce one half any further. You can't reduce 12 thirteenths any further. If you've got some form of a prime number, most times you can't reduce it any lower than it already is. So let's look at a problem. In a P, I don't know what that was. 
in a PTA class, right? We have 30 people, 13 of the students are male, 17 are female. If you write the relate relationship of male to females, well, really what we're looking at is looking at fractions, right? So 13 out of the 30 students, 13 over 30 are male, 17 out of 30 are female. We're gonna talk about coming up where we look at ratios. And in reality, when we are writing out this fraction, that's the ratio of male students is 13 to 30 and 17 to 30 for females. Ratios and proportions aren't that much different than fractions. But when you say ratios, it messes everyone's brain up, almost like when I talked about doing basic algebra. Somebody starts saying basic algebra and people's heads explode, right? But ratios are nothing more than fractions. I can just as easily go back here and get rid of that colon and put that and I got the same thing. And nothing against for fractions are nothing more than divisions. So all math, it's like I said, much like the area that I'm from, almost everything in math is relative. Some of you will get that, it'll take you a little bit, it's okay. All right, there we go. I see some smiles cracking in there, right? So we got 500 cat medicine cups are used daily at a long-term facility and a thousand uncat medicine cups are used daily at the same facility. What's the cap to uncap ratio, right? This is looking at that ratio. So we have 500 that are used that are capped, a thousands that are uncapped. So we have 500 to a thousand, which means we have one for every two or about half as many cap medicine cups are used as uncapped. That just shows ratios come into fractions. We talked about an improper fraction having a larger number numerator than denominator. They can be either mixed or whole numbers. And they're useful for use for dividing mixed numbers. For example, 16 over 8, 23 over 21, 547 over 23. When we get into division, you understand why we have to use those improper fractions. Whenever you reduce an improper fraction, it's typically going to reduce result in a mixed fraction. So we have 11 eighths down here, right? Where is my drawing? There we go. So 11 eighths is the same as saying one and three eighths, which is what I wrote down there. What that's saying is you have eight eighths plus three eighths is 11 eighths. That eight eighths is the same as saying one. So that's why it's one and three eighths. When we are reducing a fraction or trying to make things smaller, if we've got an a improper fraction, what you've got to do is take out what, how many ever totals you have to come up with what's left over for the fraction, right? If we do this in division, right? I can do the same thing. Where's my draw? Draw, not letters, draw, thank you. Thank you for letting me draw, right? So I can also do this in long division form. Oh my God, I'm horrible at drawing with this mouse. So I know that eight goes into 11 one time. I'll have a remainder three. So I have one and three eighths again. Doesn't matter how you do it. It doesn't matter if you solve it on the calculator. The answer is gonna come out the same. It's gonna be one and three eighths. So here we have that mixed number plus fraction. If we need to convert it back, right? If we ever need to convert back so that we can add these, so we have one and three quarters. We're going to take one times that and then add it to that. So one times four, right, equals four plus three gives us seven. So converting from an imp this mixed fraction to an improper fraction is going to give us seven fourths. It's just the reverse of division. I know it says just the verse. I know some of you are like, I hate math. We'll get through it, I promise you. Adding fractions. If you've got like denominators, adding fractions is easy. You keep the denominator the same, you just add across the numerators, right? So here we have three six plus two six, and it's gonna equal five six, right? The denominator stays the same. You don't add those together. You don't subtract those ever. The denominator should always stay the same. The only thing, this is the same thing as writing this.
It's really the same thing. The denominator is never going to change when you're adding or subtracting unless we have to reduce. So if we add things together and it comes up to an improper fraction, like it says down here, we got to reduce. I'll always be thinking of reducing the smallest possible number for you. It makes things easier in the long run. It also is the more correct answer. If we have mixed fractions, we're going to add the whole numbers together and then we're going to add the fractions together and that'll give us our total answer. So here we have 14 and 2 eighths plus 7 and 1 eighths. Well, we can do it any way we want. This one chose to add the fractions first, right? Because that was the way I was thinking last night. So 2 eighths plus 1 eighths equals 3 eighths. 14 plus 7 equals 21. So we combine them and our answer then would be 21 and 3 eighths. what would happen if for whatever reason we ended up with an answer that was like this 21 and 8 eighths what would be our answer for that yeah 22 exactly because 8 over 8 is the same as 1 so we're just going to add that to our whole number so we have basically here we're saying 21 plus 1 that's a 1 honest i promise I do better when I write on my tablet than I write on this thing with the mouse. So common denominators is where we come into the problems here. And this is where most people get a little hung up on fractions, right? Because common denominators are the only way we can add fractions if they don't match up. So here we have two thirds and one six. We can't add them and say that we get three ninths. It's not the way to do it. But some people do that. Not the right answer, right? So the first thing we've got to do when we're looking at this is we have to get this denominator similar to that denominator. We've got an easy one here because we know three and six, three is a factorization of six. So whatever I do to my denominator, I have to do to my numerator. So in order to make this a six, I have to multiply that times two. If I multiply that times two, got to multiply that times two. So this addition problem is the same thing as saying four six plus one six. And that's how we end up with this five six answer over here. Again, the good news is if you have a calculator that does fractions, it will calculate this for you. And in the real world, are we going to do so much of this? Maybe if you're baking, maybe if you're doing pharmaceutical measurements, which again, don't let me freak you out. Pharmaceutical measurements in the PTA field is going to be a one patient out of, I got to put this clicking pen away or I'm going to click it the whole time. You know, pharmaceutical measurements in PTA world is one in every 90 patients. So we're not going to deal with pharma a lot. But the problem comes is when we have to deal with it, we don't understand how to do math. How many of you have ever gone to a McDonald's or a Walmart or a Target and their systems have been down and they had to hand check you out? Anyone ever encounter that? And the person sitting there and they're like calculating it on the little hand calculator or the old style ticker tape and you give them a 20 and your bill is $19.99 and they can't figure out how to make change for it, right? Or worse, like your bill is 1905 and you give them 2005 thinking I'm just going to get a dollar back. And they're like, change. No, that's why I give you that five cents, right? Math is definitely not a strong suit. And actually, if you look at the United States, I think we rank something like 36 in all countries in math or something stupid like that. We're, we're not exactly a math oriented nation. What we are really oriented on is incarcerated people, I guess that's the type of math too, but it's, it's evident when you're out in the field, it's, it's amazing how many people just can't do math. I always, I always find it amusing because like, I used to live up in Pennsylvania. I used to go to Canada quite a bit, see the Americans that went over the border and saw how cheap gas was in Canada. Like, oh my God, gas is only like 79 cents a gallon not realizing it's 79 cents a liter. And then they get their bill and they're like, I don't, I don't understand, how's it so expensive? 
Well, because you're measuring different units. That's where this math comes into play. You have to be able to do this to do most of this. Now, the good news is, for most of you guys, I saw most of your uh, testing in scores. Most of you, math seems like common sense to you. So you'll get through this, this will be fine, and it'll be physics that'll hang you up. I'm okay with that. So here we have some diffi difficult common denominators, right? So we've got 13 and we got four as our denominator. Oh God, how do we find a common denominator? Well, we can multiply the two together and come up with a common denominator, right? So if we have these, if we multiply four times 13, we know that a common denominator of both of them would be 52. So then we have to go back and convert both of our fractions to a over 52 fraction. So in order to get three over 13 to 52, we have to multiply that times four and our numerator times four. So that's gonna give us 12 50 seconds. I don't know what that was. That was really badly drawn. An artiste, I am not. And then if we have one quarter, in order to get that to 52, we have to multiply both times 13. So we end up with 13 50 seconds. Now we have common denominators and we can add these together. And that's how we're gonna end up with this answer over here, 25 50 seconds. Now, can that be reduced at all? Yeah, no, 52, 22, 50 seconds, 25, 50 seconds can't be. What if instead the answer came out and it was 26, 50 seconds? Could that be reduced? And I'm getting some nods. I like it. I've just got Anne's smiling face at me from her picture. I love it. She just makes me feel good. She's smiling back at me. All right, 26 over 50 definitely can be reduced to. What can be reduced to? Yeah, one half, right? Even if we had something like 28, 50 seconds, we know that those are both even numbers. So we can, I'm sorry, Riley, sorry, I apologize. Again, I got you by the last name. It'll take me a little bit, I apologize. I will break that, just keep beating that into me and eventually like, you know, a dog, I'll, I'll hit. <laughs> Maybe just change. Mr. McKeever, I'm not, I'm not Ann, I'm Ann Riley. Okay, got it. We know that these are both even numbers, so those can be reduced. So that's kind of a clue, right? So just be paying attention when you get answers. If you can reduce it any further, it's important to be able to reduce. Comparing fractions. This is where we kind of look at if things are larger or smaller, right? If somebody says to you, I'll either give you half the pie or two eighths. I've done this to kids. I used to do this to my brother all the time. Tell you what, if you give me that dollar, I'll give you these two quarters. And just think about it. You've got two things to that one thing you had before. Anyone ever do that to their siblings or is it just me that was mean to my siblings? Right? And he'd be like, oh my God, I'm getting two things? Sure. I'm like, <laughs> Right? Until he started learning to do fractions. Then he realized that was taking, stealing money from him. And then it got less fun. I couldn't play him anymore. Right? So if we're looking at this, which is larger, a quarter or three eighths, now I can mentally look at that and do that in my head. Not everyone can. But what we have to do is first of all, create a common denominator and then figure out which one is larger. So one quarter is the same as two eighths. And we should know that three eighths having a larger numerator is bigger than two eighths, right? If you eat three slices of an eight slice pizza, you've eaten more than somebody that eats two slices. Makes sense. I keep relating it to pizza because I haven't had lunch yet. I, I was the, I was the, well, I was, I was the older brother than my little brother. Yes. But I was like, because I had two older brothers than that, and they did the same thing to me, so it was just passing along. Subtracting fractions. Well, obviously, the same thing applies here. We first of all have to make sure we have common denominators, and then we're just going to subtract the numerators from each other. 
So in this case, we have 7 eighths minus 2 eighths. Our denominators, again, in addition and fraction or subtraction, are always going to remain the same. We're just now subtracting those top two numbers from one another. So 7 minus 2, you have 5 eighths. Right? Here we have 3 ninths minus 2 ninths. Denominator stays the same. We subtract our two numerators from each other. We got 1 ninth. Here we have an improper fraction, right? So we have 25 and 3 quarters minus 20 and 1 quarter. Well, this is where we just kind of divide it up, and that's what's kind of looking like over here. We're splitting up our whole numbers from our fractions. So we try to subtract our whole numbers from each other. So 25 minus 20. Let me get my little eraser out here. Your eraser doesn't work unless I make the noise with it. Right, 25 minus 20, we got five left over. If we subtract three quarters from one quarter, we technically would get two quarters, right? But two quarters is the same as one half. So we have to reduce it. So let's say we've got, let's do, Nine eighteenths minus one half. Might be a trick question here, right? If we have to do that, we have to do one of two things. We either have to get this to match this, or get this to match this, because we can't subtract otherwise, right? We're going to finish with this kind of example here, and we'll take, give you guys a break. So I know that 9 18 is the same as what? Well, it's the same as 1 half, right? So 1 half minus 1 half, that's pretty easy. That's a big old goose egg, 0, right? If you have 0 cookies and share them among 0 friends, how many cookies does each friend get? Doesn't make sense, right? And multiply two times nine, all right? You can see either way you can do it, right? I could just do the same thing here, right? I could multiply this and turn this into nine eighteenths, right? And then I had nine eighteenths minus nine eighteenths. I got zero. Any way you do it works out. But how hard are my problems going to be for this? How hard are my problems going to be from subtraction? It'll probably be something like, 4 over 8 minus 2 over 6. OK, well, that looks difficult, Mr. McKeever. Well, no, we already learned all we have to do to create common. So there's a couple ways to do this. One of the first things I do is reduce both those fractions. But you don't have to, right? Which the way it showed us is we times 8 times 6 is what? Eight times six, half. Four eight. We could also use twenty-four, right? There's a couple different common denominators we could use here, right? But I'm just going by the way the book does it, which is dumb. So we have forty-eight. In order to get eight to forty-eight, we had to multiply that times six. So we have to multiply that times six. So we have twenty-four. Forty-eights. 48 down here, we had to multiply that times 8. So we multiply that times 8. We have 16 48. Now we can solve the problem. That would not be the way I would do this problem, though, because that made a lot of extra work for me in big numbers. I'd look at this first and go 4 8 is the same as 1 half, 2 6 is the same as 1 third. Now I have a lot smaller numbers to work with. That makes my life a whole lot easier, right? Now I'm good. I would even, I could even theoretically, if I was actually looking at this, I know that's half and go, oh, well, half is three six, and go three six minus two six and get my answer. There's multiple ways you could do it. Any of those ways work, even adding in your calculator works. 
I'm not very picky unless it comes to pizza. And then it's only cheese pizza. I'm very picky about my pizza. Don't really care what type of pizza. It just has to have cheese on it. That's all I care about. Pineapple and ham does not go on pizza. Just saying. I don't care what you say. Pineapple does not belong on pizza. Pineapple is a fruit. It belongs in salad. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll use a calculator on the boards. So the good news is most of your math questions, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop screen sharing here so I can give you a break here. There's not going to be a lot of math questions on your board. The most math questions that'll be on your board is going to be about time. And you really don't need math or calculator for that. You can scribble that and answer that one. Why we have to do math is because the Department of Education says we have to do math. Sorry, got to listen to the Department of Education. We'll get through it. Pizza is pizza for me. Oh, yeah, I agree with that, except if it has pineapple. I'm going to stop.